There was a great rabbi who lived at the early part of the uh, 20th century. He was a very famous, he's the one who actually suggested the concept of the Dafyomi. His name was Ramir Shapiro. That every day, every, a Jew, wherever he's in the world, all Jews should learn the same folio of Talmud. And it'll take seven years, you, you're able to finish the whole Talmud. So wherever the Jew may be, there will be a group of men studying it, and he could join that group. And he had built a yeshiva in Lublin, and it was known as Chakra in Lublin. What, what was so special about the yeshiva he had built, that until then, students had no dormitories. So if they had means, they could rent the room. But if they had no means, where would they sleep? They had to have some level of, roof. they had to have a roof over their head. So the storekeepers needed their stores to be protected. They had no security. So the question is, you pay a watchman or you get a yeshiva student to sleep in the store. And if he, a burglar tries to burglarize the store, there's the yeshiva student sleeping in the store. So what would happen very often? They'd leave the yeshiva student in the store. They'd lock the store on the outside. And the yeshiva student was locked in. He couldn't get out of the store. That's what, that's what happened. And it totally disrupted the lives of the yeshiva students. Why? Because what happens is the storekeeper that, that day went, came late. And the yeshiva student had to be at the yeshiva at seven in the morning. And the person, the proprietor, didn't open his store till nine o'clock, 9.30. That means until 9.30, he was incarcerated. Couldn't get out. And it led to a lot of good, not good things. So therefore he said, once and for all, I will build an edifice with a dormitory, indoor plumbing, all the, as I said, all the modern amenities he built into this dormitory. And that's how we launched the Yeshiva Chachm in Lublin. That's what it was. So, but how did he build? It cost a fortune. Where did he get the means to build this yeshiva? And he built it in the 30s. Right before the Great Depression. Came to the United States. And he was a phenomenal, phenomenal orator. And he was a genius. So not only was his delivery outstanding, but even the content of the delivery was something which was very impressive. So one of the locations he raised money was in Chicago. Went to Chicago. And he spoke. And he says, and it totally find the word kruvim. Kruvim means cherubs. We find the most obvious recollection would be the Oron, the Ark. The Ark contained the tablets, the broken tablets and the Torah itself. That's what it contained. It had a gold covering and on, on top of the gold covering, there were cherubs that were developed from that gold covering. It's not that he made it separately and attached it, sawed it on, but rather it was developed from, from the gold covering itself. So better so now, what do cherubs mean? The cherubs that were on the Oron, on the Ark. What do cherubs mean? So Rashi says, tinokos. Their faces were like the faces of newborn babes. That's how innocent and pure they were. Okay? These are the cherubs that stood on top of the Ark, on the cover of the Ark. Where else do we find cherubs mentioned in Torah? When Adam ate of the tree of knowledge with his wife, Torah tells us they were driven out of the garden and God posted, like he post centuries, posted cherubs. He posted cherubs there and they had a swinging sword. Therefore, any Jew in his right mind would not go there. Because you have these accosting angels, these cherubs, which are watching the Garden of Eden. So Adam cannot return with his wife. So Rashi says, what is cherubs in regard to the ark? 
the purity of innocent babes. In regard to the same word by the God of Eden, where you had a sword swinging back and forth, this is the cherubs were the most negative of course, the angels. So the question they asked, but he gave this public speech, he says, I mean, how could you have the same word to have so two interpretations which are so so seemingly contradictory or evidence of the spectrum? Here we're talking the ultimate pure and devout, and this is the ultimate evil, and we say they're accosting angels. So when he answered was this that if you take the Jew, you take the Jewish child and you put him on top of the ark which contains the Torah, the first set of tablets, the second set of tablets. And he looks down on the ark, that child, he, for the rest of his life, if he imbues the Torah as he should and absorbs it as he should and esteems it as he should, ultimately that Torah will make him into an innocent child. He will be have all the natural instinctive behavior to be that very special child. Which, which it has endless greater value. So the you take that child, ex, expose him to the ark, which is the Torah. That same child becomes an angel. You take that child and expose him to the sword. What does he become? He becomes a monster. You hear this? Within the spirituality of a Jew, he has a capacity to be a Mr. Jekyll and Dr. Hyde. Two different people, like a schizophrenic a personality. The It's like what we call um, what's a salamander. It's like you, where you put him, he takes on that, a chameleon. It's like a chameleon. Here it's this, there it's something else. That's exactly what a Jew is. It's not two-faced. The Jew is not a charlatan, God forbid. But based on his spiritual makeup, based on what you expose him to, that's what he becomes. You put him in a very positive environment, he thrives, he flourishes, he radiates. You take a same Jew and you put him into a negative environment where the influence is all contrary to spirituality, Every negative characteristic imaginable comes out regarding that same Jew. There was a book written, very good book. It's called Lieutenant Berenbaum. He originally grew up in Brownsville in the early 20s. And he became a second lieutenant during World War II. And he was an observant Jew, went over, fought, he was on Normandy Day, fought in the war. After the war, when the Holocaust survivors were put into DP camps, that displacement person camps, most of them, they were bereft, they lost families, and they had to be really taken care of. And he was very involved, together with the Klosenberg Rebbe, taking care of the people in these DP camps. That's, that's what he was. And he spent an extra two years in Europe was it took to be able to repatriate these people, to bring them to, to the United States, wherever they went, to empty the camps, it took about two years. And they needed all kinds of religious articles during this time. And he, he was there, and he was very involved. So after the war, he went to Paris. When Paris was, was liberated from the Nazis. You see pictures of the American soldiers with the tanks going through Paris, famous pictures through the uh, Arc de Triomphe over there, going with the tanks. And he's there, he's riding in his Jeep. And he was a person of rank. Second Lieutenant was something special. And he meets a Jew and the Jew's name is Schreiber. It's in the book. And he's very happy. He himself, as he said, he, he doesn't didn't come from a religious family. But as a young man, as a teenager, his mother was observant, and he became observant. His father was not observant, and he meets a Jew. He's very excited in Paris, and the Jew's name is Schreiber, and he tells this Birnbaum 
that he's a descendant of the Chassam Sofer. Because the Chassam Sofer's name was Schreiber. Ramosha Sofer. His name was Sofer and Schreiber in Yiddish. Do a Schreiber means a scribe. And he was very impressed. The descendant of the Holy Chassam Sofer. So he says to him, what are you doing here in, in Paris? What do you do here? He says to him, I run a burlesque house. You hear this? This is what he tells. Lieutenant Birbel felt like, like vomiting, like vomiting. You come from such a holy source. You tell me this is what you're involved in. And that then is a lot worse than what you could imagine it was. But if you come from such holy roots, the answer is you can take that same person, you expose him to the Torah, to the Ark. He radiates holiness. You take him out of his environment, put him in another environment, God forbid. Look where he's at. The same person. And that has relevance to every Jew. As a result of this, therefore, Chazal tell us, you never should pass judgment on anyone until you stand in his shoes. Because you never know the exposure he had and you were protected not to have that kind of exposure. And he has certain issues that he has to deal with because of that exposure, which you don't have. As I always say, we're not here to judge people. God judges people. People have all kinds of challenges. People went through the Holocaust. They experienced horrors which thank God we can't even relate to what those horrors were. And because of that, they become they became non-religious. With God forbid, if we would have been put through what they were put through, would, would, would we fared better? Maybe worse. They we were not passing judgment on anyone. But what the model is, a person has to be so entrenched in it, and so rooted in his spirituality that regardless of what the challenge is, you have that inner strength that you can deal with all those issues. Because you never know. You never know what's coming around the bend. You never know what's coming around the corner. There's always a curveball in life. And you have to be prepared for everything. You know, so uh, baseball players, they go down to Florida for spring training you know they haven't played you know all winter they have to really get back into the loop they have to condition themselves and at the beginning of the training they're not as good as when at the end of the training period it's all a pre training period you know we have uh military exercises what do you military exercises and they simulate situations that in case they're confronted with this situation in real they know how to deal with it we in our lives, that evil inclination is so wily. He's so cunning. He's so beyond our understanding of his capability. We have to take every precaution. We have to every, take everything into account. And God gave us the means and the mechanisms to deal with it. What are those mechanisms? Those mechanisms is the Torah itself. You study the Torah, it gives you a level of clarity and internalization of truth that you're able not only to abstractly understand something to be wrong, but you sense it's wrong. I'll give you an example. A person has no sense of smell and he walks into a room. The stench is so overwhelming, overpowering, you can't breathe. That's how bad it is. This person comes in, he has no sense of smell. He's dressed, you know, in his impeccably, high fashion, walks in there, and he sits, he's like he's sitting in paradise. The stench is so barely breathable, and he's sitting there like nothing's happening. Another person walks in who has a sense of smell. He, he can't tolerate it, not for a second. One man, it's okay. The other, it's not okay. The answer is very simple. He has a sense of smell. The other person has no sense of smell. Who has a sense of danger that you're able to sense it's not the right environment? You have to have those senses. 
you have certain senses, you're able to detect certain things in advance that you shouldn't go near them. Like there's certain people who have the ability when they meet something, buddy, they keep them, they keep themselves arm's length for that person. Of course, they have a sense the person is not is not good news. You don't want to get involved with that person. And then he approaches and says, you know, I got a deal for you. I have an opportunity. And the person ready foresaw that this man's come to offer him an opportunity. He says, you know something? I'm overprescribed, not interested. Of course, not that because he understands what the man may be, doesn't want to go near it. Because that person has that sense. God gave us the ability to have senses. You study the Torah. You live like an observant Jew. You keep yourself spiritually attuned. You're spiritually attuned. You have sense regarding what is and what's not. But the person who doesn't have it, but that's the way God created us. It's there. You have to hone it. You hone it. You maintain it. Then you have it. You don't. It's like the blind man, God forbid, or he has a cataract, until the cataract's removed, he's groping in the dark. He doesn't have clarity whatsoever. But that's exactly who every one of us is. Same idea. We find when Adam was in the, in the Garden of Eden, there were two trees. There was a tree of life, and there was a tree of knowledge. The fruit of the tree of knowledge was good and evil, and after Adam ate of the tree of knowledge, God said, he has to be put out. He has to be taken out of the, the Garden of Eden. Why? Because what happens now if he partakes of the fruit of life, the tree of life? He's going to live forever. So what happens if he lives forever? If he lives forever and he has a representation of evil within him, he turns existence on its head. Because he himself will be seen as a deity because he becomes eternal and he has this negative, impure streak within him. So he's going to draw people away from the value of existence. So at all costs, he has to be taken out of there. He can't be in the Garden of Eden. Because if he should eat, despite that he ate of the tree of knowledge, he's going to live forever. We take him out. So the question is, if he wanted to eat of the tree of knowledge, one of the first eat of the tree of life, right? God said, the day you eat of the tree of knowledge, you will die, okay? And then God says, we have to take him out of the God he made of the tree of life. So if he was smart, what he should have done was first eat of the tree of life and then eat of the tree of knowledge. He guaranteed eternity fully functioning despite the fact that you ate of the tree of knowledge. Why did he do so? So the way I understand it is this, you know, a person who's fully healthy, you say to him, you know, I think you should take vitamins. Because, you know, in 50 years, you take these vitamins and you'll be healthy. And the vitamins are very costly. Very costly. And, and they taste bitter when you swallow them. And really, it's a burden. What does the person say? Right now, I'm healthy. I'm not sure what you're saying, if, if it's even accurate. I'm not taking the vitamins. And what happens ultimately, when he reaches that moment in life, he does become ill. But why don't you take the medication? Because I'm healthy. I don't need it. I don't have a sense of what you're even talking about. Adam was so perfect before he ate of the tree of knowledge. He believed in his function. He's here forever. He radiated, he pulsated holiness. Pulsating holiness and radiating at his level, you can't believe that you could be diminished. See, even the God says that when you eat of that tree of knowledge, you will die. You'll be subject to death. You, you become a limited person, you're no longer eternal. I hear what you're saying, but the way I feel and the way I function and who I am, I don't believe it has relevance to me. Because if you really sense that reality, there's no way initially he could have eaten out of that tree of knowledge. Since because of his own setting, his own function, he took it with a grain of salt. So he said, but why did he eat of the tree of life? It's not necessary. Because I feel now I'm going to live forever in either case. 
there's no reason to take that fruit of the tree of life. But after he ate of it, and immediately he felt the diminishment, he no longer radiated. He no, no longer had the, color, the clarity of seeing from one end of the world to the other. Now he realizes he's going very quickly down that slope. And ultimately, who knows where he's going to end up. He says, you know, something, I better fortify myself. I'm going to eat of the tree of, of life. God says, if that's the case, you're out. Because if you eat of the tree of life, you're going to live as a defective person who ultimately, he cannot be punished. Because God made a commitment that if you eat of the tree of life, the fruit, you're part of eternity. As a result of it, God says, he has to be put out. But again, as perfect as you are, as holy as you are, we can't allow ourselves certain so-called perks, which we think they're innocuous. It's okay. Unless it definitely meets the standard, yet be wary. Especially the evil inclination is looking to snare you and trip you up as much as you can. You never know. But again, this is not just chance. This is reality. The evil inclination is 24-7, every moment of your life. As one mentioned, the story with Aristotle, the Rambam writes on Aristotle that his genius was a level that he was able to comprehend, come upon concepts that only a prophet was able to come upon those truths because God communicated to him. That, that was the level of his genius and brilliance, Aristotle. So one time they caught Aristotle committing adultery. Could you imagine? So he said, Aristotle, you're the genius of geniuses. You have an understanding of everything. How do you do such a vile, unacceptable act? So he said it was in the genius response, that moment when I committed adultery, I wasn't Aristotle. He was so overwhelmed with desire to do that. At that moment, his intelligence had no relevance to his behavior. You understand? Every human being can be overtaken by that. And you never know where you could go because of that. But if you have a model and understand what the consequences, then you stay away from the tree of knowledge. The Torah uses the term, he was driven out of the Garden of Eden. He wasn't put out. He was driven out. Driven out means he had, at, on the moment, it's like today people work for companies. The moment they get the pink slip, you know what happens? They immediately, they lock his desk, take all his personal belongings, to put it outside the door, and they have somebody to escort him out of the building, and they take away his security pass so that he can't come back in the building. Immediately. No lingering, because a man gets a, a yellow, a, a pink slip, you never know what he may do. You know, he could destroy the files. He could do who knows what, because he's upset. Adam knowing now how he's been diminished, every moment there's a chance he may eat of the tree of life. If that's the case, we've got to, he has to be driven out. No, not even a moment's hesitation. Nope, you should be, be a little more humane. Be more sensitive to the man. He can't. Time's of the essence. He has to be out. Because all everything's at stake at this moment. Now, if a person as great as Adam could be seduced and convinced to do the wrong thing, who had level of clarity, we who are infinitesimal to what he was, Little peons, nothing. How do we take a chance? You have to take every precaution. The whole concept of rabbinic fences is exactly for that reason. Because the rabbis understood to the core of what a human being is, 
and all his vulnerabilities because of his physical makeup, you got to take so many precautions, which are called fences, that he shouldn't cross those lines because that's a reality. If the greatest human being who ever lived, who was created, who's the handiwork of God, who had this level of clarity and depth of understanding, and he could eat of the tree of knowledge, for whatever reason, we were considered blind man, men in the middle of the day when the sun is shining brightly. We shouldn't eat fences to keep away arm's length minimally from things we shouldn't be doing. Because if we got close enough, definitely we're inclined to do it. That is, the, that is the reason and the only reason why the rabbinic fences are necessities for, sure, for Jewish survival. I always say, people say, what's a fanatic? A fanatic is anybody who's to, to, to the right of me. And what's a heretic? Anybody who's to the left of me. And where do you stand? I stand in the middle. And where's the middle? Whatever I choose to be the middle. You understand? Yeah. Unless you know exactly who you are and where you stand, you don't know what the right is, you don't know what the left is. And you should know, sometimes, you know, you fly in a plane, especially a person is a pilot. If he doesn't have radar and he goes through a cloud, he doesn't know if he's sitting right side up or upside down. He loses the sense of what? Of direction, totally. Unless you have that radar. A human being, due to our conflicts of interest, due to our own inhibitions and inclinations, we can see whatever we, we can see things the way we want to see them due to those conflicts of interest. It can be as rosy as rosy and it's bleaker than bleak, but we can convince ourselves for our own reasons why. And when you read the narrative of Adam, how he deluded himself with the ultimate level of clarity. So we, where we start at a, almost a nil level, how much will we have to be concerned that we shouldn't see the wrong thing as right and the right thing as wrong be continued.